This is part two of David Lewis's theory of modality and his view of possible worlds. Before we get into the thick of things, I have a caveat. Hello, before I get into the details of his theory of modality, I just thought I'd let you know that while I will do my best, of course, to describe the theoretical ideas that are important for understanding Lewis's approach to modality, it is relevant to know that we are calling on ideas related to personal identity over time, especially. And so I'm going to talk about temporary intrinsics and those kinds of concerns. As I record this, I've not made videos on that topic, but you uh, may be viewing at a time after I did make videos on that topic. So if, as you're going through this, things are a bit confusing, I encourage you to make sure that you understand some of the background metaphysical concepts and then go through the video one more time if, if you need to. Counterpart theory for Lewis is a reference to how he talks about individuals and possibilities. So to say things like, I could have been taller, is to say that in some possible world, I have a counterpart that is taller than I am. And of course that possible world is concrete and that counterpart of mine is concrete and is very, very similar to me, right? This is a person who claims the, plays the same role as I do in this world, but is taller. So Lewis compares counterpart theory to perdurance by temporal parts. So here's where we need to use some, some other metaphysics, and I'll try to walk through it here. So one difference between counterpart theory and, and temporal parts is going to be that the trans world individual composed of counterparts is, for the large part, ignored, although we do want to say a few things, whereas uh, the individual composed of temporal parts is really important, right? That's what you or I are. We are individuals composed of temporal parts, so according to Lewis's metaphysics. But we wouldn't have that same identity with a trans world individual. So let's think about the problem of accidental intrinsics, right? Consider the principle of the indiscernibility of identicals. So if X is identical with Y, then X and Y have all properties in common. So we use this principle in our everyday reasoning. Detectives use it to identify a perpetrator of a crime. Uh, sociologists, archeologists, even natural scientists use this principle, right? It's, it's very reasonable. If, if we have one individual, that one individual has all and only those properties that the individual has. And if we're talking about something that has a different property, then we're not talking about that individual. Okay, so the indiscernibility of identicals motivated Lewis to affirm temporal parts and perdurance, right? So the idea here is that if I'm sitting and in two minutes from now I'm standing, well, we have two different properties and these are uh, contradictory properties. You can't be both sitting and standing at the same time. And so what Lewis does is he says, well, that means they're not the same entity. So me now sitting, that's a temporal part. That's one entity. Me future standing is a different temporal part, a different entity. So we exist through having various temporal parts at different times, and that's perdurance. Okay, so that's Lewis's approach to temporal parts. And, but we use that same motivation, right, for Lewis to deny that any person can exist in more than one possible world, right? Because that other possible world is going to be someone with a different property. Now, the problem of accidental intrinsics, you know, I could have had a, a blue shirt on today when in fact I'm wearing a red one, that's similar to the problem of temporary intrinsics, right? So he makes that analogy, he's very consistent in his metaphysics. 
So let's uh, think of how this works then, right? One of the implications is going to be that Lewis thinks that possible worlds are divergent, not branching. So you don't have the same possible world existing through one history and then branch out into two different possible worlds, which is the way some physicists describe uh, such things. But philosophers, Lewis, who's a concretist on this, uh, says that, no, in fact, you have uh, two different possible worlds throughout the same time, right? They just have overlapping segments, segments that can be described in exactly the same way, but uh, they are two separate, distinct possible worlds. Okay, before we go on into uh, more of the theory, uh, this is not quite as significant, but I thought I would mention there are some concerns about labels. So for example, uh, Mike Locks and many others label uh, Lewis as a possible world nominalist, but Lewis doesn't accept that label. He calls his position modal realism, and he claims that others, like Alvin Plantinga, are modal earsatzers. Uh, they're not taking uh, modal modality seriously. Now, the, the complete charge comes from the other side. So Plantinga rejects the label, of course, it's somewhat insulting. He argues that his position is the realist position because he takes modality seriously, right? It's modality that he's taking seriously. So he argues that you can't reduce modality to something else, which is exactly what Lewis is doing. He's reducing modality to sets of concrete things. Now, of course, Lewis responds back that, look, when you're talking about these two theories, at least his and Plantinga's, in neither one does a person himself do other than what is done in the actual world. So in both theories, individuals are represented as doing something else. Lewis's theory represents by concrete individuals, things that we're familiar with, says Lewis whereas Plantinga represents by sentences or pictures or some kind of magic, says Lewis. Okay, now, actually, okay, in one sense, technically, there are no actual trans world individuals because that would violate the indiscernibility of identicals, right? You can't have the same thing with contrasting properties, right? All individuals are world bound. None of us exist in more than one possible world. We only exist in the possible world that we are in. That's it. And Lewis does allow for unrestricted composition based on classes. And so for every class, there's going to be a corresponding object. And so you can have this muriological sum that you can call an individual. But there are some odd consequences to this, right? Technically, there are trans world individuals because we can talk about the class of counterparts that make up an individual. You can talk in that way. These are composed of several individuals in several worlds. But note that they are impossible. Why? Because none exist in any given possible world. And if something fails to exist in every possible world, then it is impossible. So you can speak of these things, but what you're speaking of are classes that are impossible. Okay, trans world individuals then, these are the sets of individuals united by this counterpart relation. Now, of course, ordinary people are not trans world individuals. We are all world bound individuals. I'm not a trans world individual. You're not a trans world individual. Uh, no other object is trans world individual. None of the things we're normally interested in, in terms of possibility and necessity and so on. Because none of these things exist, those actual things we're talking about, none of them exist in more than one world. Okay, couple final points. Ordinary objects exist 
according to multiple worlds. So we can talk about, you know, I exist in some other possible world, but we have to keep in mind what we're doing there is we're saying that there is a counterpart of me that exists in that other possible world, right? So I don't exist in multiple worlds. I only exist in one. Now this sounds like you're getting rid of day ray modality in terms of possibilities at least, right? It sounds like then it seems like it's impossible for me to be taller than I am or have a different colored hair or wear different clothes on this particular day. But day ray modal properties can be explained in terms of what properties one one's counterparts have. That's how you talk about de re modal properties. So if every counterpart of X has a property P, then P is essential to X. So if every counterpart of U has a property of being a human, then being a human is essential to you. You cannot exist without being a human. A couple other labels here. Lewis's view is possibilism because there are possible but non-actual entities that exist. They exist in other possible worlds, but they're not actual because they don't exist in the actual world, not the one that we call the actual world, at least. And Lewis's view is concretism. Possible worlds are concrete entities.